the next speaker will be um, Jennifer Javna, uh, who will talk about CRISPR. Um, I have a special affection for Jennifer because when I was director of NSF, she received one of the outstanding awards. Um, it was a five-year award for research um, given at the National Science Board dinner. And I think we chose well because she has gone from deciphering the molecular structure of ribosomes, the RNA enzymes, and other functional RNA studies to the hottest thing right now, which is CRISPR. So um, we're lucky to have Jennifer here today to talk about this new area of science. Jennifer? Great. Well, thank you very much, Mayan. Thank you very much. This has uh, been a fabulous meeting. I'm really, I'm, my head is buzzing. It's, there's so much interesting. Um, so many interesting things being discussed here. It's just, just really incredible to be included. I, I really appreciate it. And uh, what I thought I would do is really just talk to you about uh, the science that we've been doing. I'm happy to share later uh, you know, some of my experiences uh, in, in science and being a woman in science, but usually I don't think about that too much. Honestly, I just think about the science. Um, You're too young. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah. We'll, we'll discuss that later. Um, so um, this is a story that really begins with very basic science, a curiosity-driven project, as I'll describe to you very briefly, that led to a discovery that you know, we couldn't have predicted at the outset that is you know, really very exciting now as a technology and that I'm, I'm myself personally very excited to see many labs now around the world adopting. So I'm going to just uh, tell you how we got into this. And uh, it basically started with a phone call that I got in my office in, in Berkeley in, in around 2005 from Jill Banfield, who's a very well-known uh, scientist who works in, in our College of Natural Resources. And she works on bacterial communities and does a lot of uh, genomic sequencing of bacteria. And she called me up and she said, you know, Jennifer, I, I, uh, you know, we didn't know each other, honestly, very well, but, but she said, you know, I know you work on, on RNA and you're interested in how RNA molecules control expression of genes, and we've, we've stumbled across something in our sequencing data that, that might be relevant to that. And she told me, we met for coffee, and she told me that, um, that there was a, um, an emerging idea in the world that she inhabited um, that many bacteria might have the ability to acquire sequences from viruses that infect them and in turn use those sequences to encode RNA molecules that then might protect the cells. And the reason that this idea had emerged was the publication of three papers, the bottom one is cut off here, but uh, three <coughs> papers that were published in 2005 in which groups were reporting that many bacterial uh, genomic sequences had what are called CRISPR loci, which are shown here. This pointer is not working. Oh, you have another. Is not it's it? actually the Just screen itself is too. Oh, okay. The screen is very light. Okay. Um, so they have CRISPR <laughs> loci that contain repetitive sequences, and that had been observed. And uh, a few labs um, had had published this observation. Nobody knew what these did. And what these papers in 2005 all reported was that these CRISPR loci, in, in addition to these repetitive sequences shown in the black diamonds, they also include sequences in between the repeats that correspond exactly to sequences found in viruses or plasmids that, get, that can get into these cells. And so this was the first interesting hint that these might actually represent some kind of acquired immune system in bacteria. And I want to point out that this was research that was done originally in, you know, not in big, well-funded, fancy labs, right? These were people, you know, microbiology labs and, and sequencing groups that were kind of just working away and, and noted, you know, made this very, very interesting observation. So Jill uh, Banfield said, you know, um, I wonder if these sequences are actually encoding uh, RNA. Maybe they're transcribed, and then maybe these these copies, these RNA copies of sequences that come from viruses are then somehow used to protect the cells from the, uh, those very same viruses. And one reason to think that might have been a possibility, might be a possibility was that in addition to the CRISPR loci, 
um, there were very typically a set of CRISPR-associated or Cas genes that co-vary with the CRISPR <laughs> loci. And those had also been seen by various uh, groups doing sequencing. Great, thank you. And, um, and so the idea was, you know, maybe this is some kind of real, real system in these <coughs> cells. And so um, we set out to, to investigate this and kind of figure out if this might actually be going on. And, um, and so what emerged in, in over the next, uh, I would say, two or three years was this um, idea that's sort of summarized here about the way, uh, the function of these CRISPR loci. And what, what is now understood is that in organisms that have these, these loci, they actually do have the ability to adapt to viruses that infect the cells. And the way they do that is they detect foreign DNA that gets into the cell, they snip out a little piece of the viral DNA, and they actually integrate it into this CRISPR locus. And they do it in such a way that each new sequence that's shown by, represented by the green boxes here, is flanked on either side by a copy of the repeat. And that turns out to be very important because the, these entire repetitive sequences are then turned into RNA in the cell. They're transcribed into RNA molecules that are copies of the DNA sequences. And those RNAs are subsequently broken down into smaller RNAs that each include a sequence derived from a virus or a plasmid. And those sequences are then, um, those RNAs are assembled with proteins encoded by the Cas genes to form RNA protein complexes that use the genetic information now in the form of an RNA molecule that can recognize by base pairing a viral DNA sequence that matches the sequence in this RNA. So it's a very clever way that the bacteria are able to use that genetic information acquired from viruses to actually protect the cells because these RNA protein complexes use that information to base pair with foreign DNA and lead to its degradation. All right, and this is really summarizing work that was done in a number of labs, but I want to mention one in particular, um, the group of, of Philippe Horvath and Rodolphe Barango, two scientists who were working at the time at Denisco, a yogurt company. And they were interested in this because they were trying to protect the bacterial cultures they used to make yogurt from being destroyed by viruses. So it was a very practically motivated kind of project, but it led to this initial genetic proof that, that that's how these systems are functioning. And so, um, so in my lab, um, we set out to figure out how this actually works. How, 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 does this, how is this operating on a molecular level? And we were particularly interested in this sort of, initially at least, in this sort of middle step here involving the production of RNA molecules that could assemble with the Cas proteins and lead to degradation or destruction in some way of, um, of viral DNA. And so I'll, I, I won't tell you all of the different things that were done uh, to, 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 to look into this, but um, in the course of that sort of overarching project, I got invited to a type of meeting that I would never uh, normally get invited to, which was a meeting sponsored by the American Society of Microbiology in 2011. They were having a conference in San Juan, Puerto Rico, and um, I went to this conference and I felt a little bit out of place because I'm, I'm not a microbiologist at all, but I was hoping to learn something. And at that meeting, I met um, another uh, scientist who is a, a microbiologist, and, and, and that's Emmanuel Charpentier. And so Emmanuel and I met at this conference, and um, she, her, her lab had, had, right before that meeting, a very exciting paper had been published in Nature from her group showing that in, uh, in, some, types of, uh, in, in, in some types of CRISPR systems, in particular in a, a system found in Streptococcus pyogenes, which is a bacterial pathogen that her laboratory was investigating, it turns out that in that uh, type of CRISPR system, she had discovered a second uh, RNA, type of RNA, that is encoded outside of this, uh, this immediate locus, but is critical for leading to the proper production of CRISPR molecules from this locus in strep pyogenes. And so they had 
published this paper, and I was drawn to it because, of, because I, I, I love RNA, and I was thinking about how this RNA might work. And so we got to chatting at this conference, and she said, you know, I would really love to work with you to figure out the function of the key gene in this particular CRISPR system, which is a protein called Cas9. So it's a, you know, one of these sort of CRISPR-associated genes. Again, uh, had been shown by various groups genetically to be critical for the immune system function in that type of, of uh, organism, but nobody knew really what this protein encoded by Cas9 actually did. And so we initiated a, a really fun collaboration between our groups to figure this out. And um, this led to a, a, you know, a sort of a multi-country uh, interaction. So Emanuel's lab was in Sweden at the time. Uh, she had a graduate student who was working in Vienna. And um, then there was my group at, in Berkeley. And so we, uh, thank goodness for Skype. So there's lots of um, uh, you know, cross-Atlantic uh, phone calls and Skype calls to discuss this project. And the outcome turned out to be truly very exciting. It's something that none of us initially predicted, and that was that Cas9 uh, turned out to be a dual RNA-guided DNA endonuclease. So what do I mean by that? Well, I'll just, I'm just gonna show you in this cartoon, um, and I should say that this is work that was done by two fabulously talented people, uh, Martin Jinek in my uh, laboratory, a postdoctoral associate, and Christoph Chylinski in Emanuel's lab. And it really was a very much a, a, a cross uh, collaboration to get this done. And what uh, Martin and, and Christoph figured out was that Cas9, <coughs> which is shown in this blue, sort of a, represented by this blue blob here, is a big protein that um, has a very interesting function and it's critical for this immune system because what it does is it actually binds to two separate RNA molecules. One of them is this one drawn right here, which comes from the CRISPR locus and includes a sequence shown in this box that uh, would be derived from a virus and has uh, the ability to base pair with DNA, as shown in this cartoon. And very importantly, this RNA on its other end has a sequence that interacts with the second type of RNA that Emanuel's lab had discovered to be important in this system called tracer to allow a structure to form between these two RNA molecules that binds to the Cas9 protein. Critical to have both of these RNA molecules present in the system. And when they are, this sequence in the CRISPR RNA can base pair with DNA and position the Cas9 protein with its two molecular blades, two active sites, to generate a double-stranded cut in the DNA at a very precise position within this region that's recognized by the CRISPR RNA sequence. And in bacteria, this is a really nifty tool because it allows the bacterium to steal sequences from viruses and they end up in this RNA, and they're then used to recognize those very same sequences that crop up in viruses should they try to reinfect the cell and allow this protein to cut up the DNA, and then the DNA ends up getting degraded. So for bacteria, it's a great, a great system. Um, but we were very, very intrigued by this because we thought, well, if this is, a, if this is an RNA-guided, double-stranded DNA <coughs> enzyme and we can figure out how it works, maybe we can program it to recognize any DNA sequence. And so one of the things that Martin in my lab ended up doing was, um, was to really test what were the sequence requirements of these two RNA molecules. So he made a number of mutations and trimmed away at these RNAs. And what he figured out was that he could actually, um, he, he was able to trim these down to a point where we realized that probably these two ends of these, what are in nature separate RNA molecules could actually be linked together covalently. And so he was able to generate an artificial type of RNA shown here, a single guide RNA that contains both the targeting information and the structural information required to bind to Cas9 in the same RNA molecule. And, um, he, you know, so we sort of had this idea, he designed this and tested it in the laboratory, and 
Um, this is some of the raw data, and it's a little bit fainter on the slide, but the experiment was to take a plasmid DNA so molecule, so this is a circular, double-stranded uh, DNA molecule, and we thought if we really understand how the system is working and with this re-engineered RNA molecule, we should be able to just pick sequences in the plasmid and design guide RNAs that match those sequences and then observe Cas9 cutting those sequences. And so in this experiment, what Martin did was to design five different guide RNAs that recognize sequences shown by these red bars on either the top or bottom strand of the DNA. And we did an experiment where we um, incubated these guide RNAs with Cas9 and the plasmid DNA. And to be able to figure out what was where these cuts were being made in the DNA, we, we actually included a separate, a second restriction enzyme that digests the DNA about 60 base pairs upstream of this region in the plasmid. And not sure you can see this down here, but th this is a, um, a, an, an agarose gel system that we used to analyze the products of those cleavage reactions. And what we found was that these little fragments of DNA that were released in each of these digested uh, uh, plasmid reactions corresponded in size to where we expected cleavage to occur based on these, the positions of these guide RNAs. So this was really that you know, moment when we said, wow, we really have a programmable DNA endonuclease. And why were we so excited about this? Well, I think this was kind of, for me, was sort of the moment when this project went from being just an interesting basic science, how do bacteria fight the flu kind of project, to being something where we had, I really had chills going down my spine because I thought this could be an incredible technology. And I'll tell you why we had that thought. And the reason is that you know there had been a long history for decades really of people um, investigating how cells deal with breaks in DNA. And back when I was a graduate student in Jack Shostak's lab in the 1980s, you know, he published a great paper with Terry or Weaver proposing the double strand break repair model for DNA. And even though I didn't work on that in his lab, it was you know, something that I you know, felt very, uh, was very interested in because it had gone on right before I got to his laboratory. And in the intervening years, of course, many people had thought about how you could take advantage of natural repair pathways in cells to manipulate genomic DNA sequences. And what had emerged from uh, you know, many, many, many labs uh, investigating this is that if there were a way to control where a double-stranded break was introduced, into DNA, cells have natural repair pathways by which they can um, paste the DNA back together. And they do it by really two major types of repair pathways. One is called non-homologous end joining, where the DNA ends are ligated back together chemically, often with introduction of a small insertion or deletion at the site of the break. And the other repair pathway is called homology-directed repair, in which a uh, piece of donor DNA, it could come from within the cell, for example, the other, another allele of a gene within a cell, or it could come from DNA supplied by the experimenter. If it has sequences that are complementary to the site that, uh, where the double-stranded break was introduced, that donor DNA can be recombined exactly into the DNA at the site of the break to introduce new genetic information in a site-specific way. And so um, some of you might know that there's a, you know, there's a very exciting sort of explosion of research in this area, particularly in the last few years, in which um, various groups have been able to make proteins called either zinc finger nucleases or talon proteins, or there's also homing endonucleases and other sort of variations on this theme, which are all basically proteins that can be programmed to bind to specific sequences in DNA and have been engineered to have a molecular cleavage domain that will generate breaks in the DNA at that site of recognition. So these are all protein-based ways of generating site-specific uh, breaks in DNA. And there's lots of excitement about this, and you know, the, every you know, it seemed like you know two or three years ago, every every uh, every other month there'd be a you know exciting uh, paper on this. And so I was sort of paying attention to it a bit peripherally um, at the time. 
But what struck us about Cas9 was we thought, you know, this could be a really interesting and different way to do this because here we have a single protein whose recognition of DNA sequences is guided by RNA. So instead of relying on protein DNA recognition, we have a system where we're relying on RNA DNA base pairing for recognition. And why, why does this matter? Well, it turns out that if you have to design a new protein or pair of proteins for every site that you might like to engineer in a cell, um, that turns out to be a, you know, a big challenge in terms of protein engineering, just the you know, technology and, and expense that goes into doing that and then vetting and testing each of those proteins. Whereas if you have a system like this where you can simply change the sequence of a short RNA and we had turned it into a, a, a two component system, a single protein and a single RNA, we thought this could be a lot easier and could engender a much simpler way of being able to make targeted changes to, to genomes. And, and as you all know, you know, there's sort of also in the last 10 to 15 years, huge explosion in research in genomics and many, many genome sequences available and lots of excitement about the information that's coming out of all of that. And really what was missing was a tool to enable easy manipulation of those sequences. Um, and this is just showing the, you know, sort of um, illustrating in a little more detail what I've already said about zinc finger nucleases and, and talon uh, effector proteins. These, these are protein-based ways of recognizing DNA and generating a break. And what the Cas9 system does is to enable RNA DNA base pairing to guide the site of the, of the break that gets introduced. So it's just becomes a much simpler and faster way to do this kind of genetic manipulation. Um, okay. <coughs> okay, and so I sort of was thinking about this in light of sort of the tools that have come, been coming along in molecular biology over the last several decades. So, you know, really starting with understanding the structure of DNA, so it's very relevant to the work of Rosalind Franklin, of course, and, I, and she's been someone that I've idolized for a long time. I think the first book I read in science in sixth grade was all about, you know, the discovery of the double helix and prominently featured, you know, her work, um, but also DNA sequencing. And then, you know, tools that came along, interestingly, also from uh, bacterial systems that allowed manipulation of DNA involving either restriction enzymes or the polymerase chain reaction that allowed scientists to, to, um, to isolate particular fragments of DNA and amplify them. Um, and I think what, what Cas9 uh, does now is to really make genome editing a much a more accessible kind of technology than it's ever been in the past. <coughs> and so what's been very interesting for us is that, so we published the initial work on Cas9 and how it functions in the summer of 2012, and we proposed in that paper that this could be a very interesting technology for genome engineering. And then, of course, set about trying to test that idea. And of course, uh, other people read this paper, and of course, they started testing it too, which is great. And, um, and this is just sort of summarizing uh, uh, the, way that, the way that this works, as I mentioned already, with a single RNA, a single protein generating double-stranded breaks in DNA that can be repaired in a site-specific fashion. And I didn't mention this earlier, but naturally in bacteria, this system operates in a, in a way that we could describe as multiplexing, right? What does that mean? Well, it means that in a single bacterial cell, <laughs> Cas9 would very typically be programmed with multiple different RNA sequences to protect the cells from multiple different viruses, just like we have different kinds of antibodies to protect us from different kinds of pathogens. And so that means that we can do the same kind of thing in an experimental setting. We can program Cas9 in the same cell to recognize multiple different sites. And this is enabling uh, labs now, uh, you know, around the world really, to um, manipulate cells in ways that really have been very difficult or perhaps impossible in the past, where you can actually cut out uh, segments of the genome and replace them with different sequences. You can generate cells that um, exactly uh, copy the kinds of chromosomal translocations that occur in cancer, on and on, right? So very, very um, interesting to have that kind of technical capability. And so what happened, um, this is just showing publications, and this is actually um, <laughs> um, kind of embarrassingly now out of date because this really should be 
off the top of the uh, chart. The last time I checked, there were over 400 uh, papers so far this year. But basically, what we saw was that um, in terms of the, the CRISPR-Cas9 literature, there was sort of not very much at all. And then in 2013, about six months after the publication of this uh, paper in 2012, there were a flurry of about six papers showing that this system could be used to um, engineer the genomes of different kinds of, of, of systems and organisms, and this is just um, really exploding. And so it's been extremely uh, exciting and intense for, for us and our lab to be involved in this, and you know, we're working as hard as we can to try to make this system available to as many people in labs as possible and to, to really see this technology be used eventually really to, to, to help uh, people and, and to help you know, human um, societies in different ways. And I just want to close by with two uh, slides. So this is really showing uh, the different kinds of systems that have been edited uh, and, and are being engineered using this uh, kind of technology. And so um, there's lots of different, different cell lines. This is, by the way, not comprehensive at all, but you know, showing you that different kinds of model <coughs> organisms have been investigated and are being manipulated using this kind of genome uh, engineering technology. Lots of biotechnology uh, applications in plants and different kinds of fungi, people interested in using this for uh, systems biology and manipulating uh, different kinds of single-celled uh, organisms. And then, of course, lots of interest going forward in how we might be able to use this for various kinds of biomedical applications. And I just wanted to... Uh, um, resolution doesn't look very good, sorry about that, but um, basically this is just showing uh, some of the different kinds of applications that are envisioned for this type of genome engineering. So not only <coughs> things like human gene therapy, which may be kind of out there, but, but thinking about, you know, how do you screen for um, drug, you know, genes in cells that allow, uh, allow cancer cells to become drug resistant, right? This is, I think, going to be a very interesting application of the technology um, George Church's lab has proposed uh, vector control, mosquito sterilization, this sort of thing using this. We can think about uh, targeting viruses and other kinds of pathogens using this technology already. A number of papers in the literature showing the potential to do this. Um, and then potentially using it for other kinds of things like programmed RNA targeting, something that our own lab is, is investigating. So I think that you know, um, it's, it's an exciting time with a technology that you know, has a lot of potential. And what I'm excited to do is really just to be part of it and to uh, share with you that this is really a discovery that came out of a, a very basic science kind of project. And I'm a big proponent of funding curiosity-driven research that's not necessarily targeted to any one thing. But as you can see, you know, these sorts of projects every now and then, they lead to something unexpected. I just want to close with two slides. I wanted to show you the team. So um, uh, in terms of women in science, uh, here, here's two women in science right here. Um, my colleague and friend, Emmanuel Charpentier, on the, on the end, myself, and, um, and then Martin Jinek and Christoph, who the two key uh, people in our labs who did a lot of the experiments, as well as um, Inez Fonfara on the end, who is a postdoc with Emmanuel, who did uh, some contributing experiments as well. We're missing uh, one person, Mickey Hauer, who was an undergraduate student in the lab with, with us with, and worked with Martin the first uh, summer that we started this collaboration. And his golden hands led to the first preparations of Cas9 that enabled those biochemical experiments. So a very, very important uh, participant in the project. And then I just wanted to close with some acknowledgments here. So here's a few of the people that are currently working on different aspects of this project. And on the end, again, is Martin, who's now running his own lab at University of Zurich. I want to acknowledge uh, also, in particular, my colleague Eva Nogales at Berkeley. So she and I share an office suite. Our labs are across the hall from each other. And we've done lots of things collaboratively over the years, including working now on different structures of the, these uh, CRISPR-Cas uh, type complexes. And then um, this is a, a picture of my group taken at Tilden Park in, in Berkeley. And I want to just acknowledge um, in particular two funding sources that were critical for this work to be done. So I was not funded by NIH for this, OK? So critically, uh, we, had, we had a small but essential <coughs> grant from the National Science Foundation to support the initial experiments 
that led to all of this. So critical funding. It supported one and a half people in the lab, and they were the key people that got all of this going for us. And then, of course, I'm incredibly grateful to the Howard Hughes Medical Institute for support. And as you heard from Robert Teejan this morning, um, the Hughes uh, Institute supports projects. You know, they don't support specific projects. They support uh, people. So you know, th that kind of funding enabled me to have the, the uh, uh, flexibility to move people on to a new area that I thought was just interesting to pursue. And with that, I'll, I'll stop. And if you have questions.